Thank you very much indeed, Christina, and to Graham and the school for hosting this wonderful uh, conclusion to the very successful fall 2009 season. It's a great, great privilege and pleasure to have you with me tonight, Pat. Um, Pat has really turned the place upside down to, turn, to bring our, cent our gallery into, uh, into high modernism with a, with a, a wall drawing and installation. Uh, which it, it, it's, it's always a, you know, when you, when you curate a space, you have a kind of proprietorial relationship with it. And it's um, uh, one of those weird exhilarations from show to show to see, you know, this, this painting is where that painting used to be and the sculpture's blocking the view of where that used to be. And it's like when you rearrange the furniture in your living room, but uh, when you have one of the most internationally renowned painters of our day come in and uh, literally transform those uh, original Whitney rooms into something as magical as the wall drawing downstairs, then there's uh, no possibility of any palimpsests anymore. I can no longer see the Moskowski drawing here or the Susanna Coffey there. It's just the space is, is very radically transformed. Pat, as I don't need to tell, uh, two full rooms at the studio school is internationally renowned for her Monument, often monumentally scaled paintings that uh, lyrically and dramatically exploit chance effects and in so doing form a rapport with similar phenomena in nature itself, such as waterfalls. But as we're going to discover this evening, that tremendous body of work uh, for which she's so justly uh, celebrated um, is but one side of a very complex artistic personality that has evolved from, as we'll see in the slide presentation, um, uh, unexpected perhaps places. Um, Pat Steer was born in Newark, New Jersey and is based in New York City. She's lived and worked in Italy, Holland and California. She studied at Pratt Institute, where she now holds an honorary doctorate, and at Boston University, and has taught at the California Institute of Arts, Parsons School of Design, Princeton University, and Hunter College. She's been the subject of solo museum exhibitions uh, in many institutions, including the Corcoran Gallery, the Brooklyn Museum, uh, Des Moines Art Center, LA County Museum, PS1, and the Albright Knox Gallery, Buffalo, as well as museums in Dublin, Lyon, Geneva, Berlin, Rome, and Reykjavik. She's represented by Chime and Reed, New York, and also shows at Rona Hoffman Gallery, Chicago, Harley Baldwin Gallery, Aspen, and Locks Gallery, Philadelphia. Her work is represented in numerous collections, too many to list in, a, in any way that does justice to her uh, celebrity, but her works are certainly in the permanent collections, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, National Gallery of Art, Whitney Museum of American Art, Museum of Modern Art, New York, and the Tate Gallery, London. She is a founding member of Printed Matter Bookshop and of Heresies Magazine, and has served on the editorial board of Semio Text. And Pat's involvement and interest in poetry is something that is going to be among the topics that I'm very much looking forward to to talking with her this evening. It's a great honor to have in our audience uh, the great Anne Waldman, with whom I unabashedly and unashamedly announce uh, Pat collaborated in my own um, online publication recently. Uh, I have a series there that's guest edited uh, by or has a consulting editorial input of Bill Berkson, uh, where poets and painters or visual artists um, their collaborations are, are celebrated, and the current collaboration is uh, a beautiful, I'm not going to describe it here because we'll discuss it later, a beautiful uh, scroll, a pair of scrolls with an image by Pat and a poem, Cry, Stall, Gaze, or Crystal Gaze, by Anne Waldman. And that... Um, leads me also to want to mention that this being one public event tied in with the exhibition downstairs, we have another 
which I'd love you to put in your calendars. I know you've been told to turn off your cell phones, but if your cell phone also doubles as your address book, you have official permission to turn it on again. And note that on December the 13th, um, Anne Waldman and John Yao will be reading at Sunday, December the 13th, 4 p.m. in the gallery. All very warmly welcome to that. Now, what we're going to do this evening is we have some images first and some chatter afterwards, which is the right way of doing things. No disrespect to our poet. Image comes first. Um, I asked Pat and her able assistant, Lily, if, if they could let me have some images because I wanted to put together a PowerPoint for her. And Pat said, I've been following my work rather longer than you have. So perhaps it's better that I present the PowerPoint. And I said, excellent. That's one less job for me. So with no further ado, Pat is going to guide us through uh, a slideshow. And then we'll, I'll, I'll rejoin her for a chat. This is called Legend. I did it in 10 years or eight years, I guess. And then I got a teaching job at Boston Teaching Organization. And I was able to start to paint. This is called Legend. And I'm showing it to you because I titled it Legend because legend is what you see at the bottom of a map, a legend. You know, the legend tells you where you are, where you were, and where you're going. And oddly enough, Everything in this painting became my life work, one after the other, without concentrating on it and without knowing that I was doing that. When legend, the painting legend came back into my possession, I was astonished to see what it had in it, all the work I've been doing for the last uh, 40 years. The little pink painting beside it is from 1998, and it relates to the pink rectangle in legend. The figure here is the last figure I painted, though, in the wall drawing set I do. There are figures that are borrowed images. It here has many borrowed images and references to other artists. The birds all come from Audubon books, and so my invented uh, this refers to Agnes Martin. This refers to Bryce Martin, who was already quite mature, and, and although we went to school together when I was starting out, he was already immature and had been to school. I want to say that I'm a little bit nervous because there's so many new artists in the audience. <laughs> They'll be Ralph Vermeer and Connie and Jake Sienna, Beryl Hill, Stephen Hill, Rob Wendt, and Maureen Travis. I have to calm myself. I never lectured in front of friends before. Okay. This is from 2007, and it's a, a 10 foot square painting, and it's called Pink. And it's a pink pour over green. At some point, I started to limit myself. <laughs> And I, I said, well, don't use brushes anymore. And so my, my paintings are all poured. In, in that way, they, they're uh, dependent on uh, gravity, um, chaos, and uh, some, some grace. The, the painting on your right, 1971, was, it's called Looking for the Mountain. And in 1971, I went with my friend Douglas Crimp, who I had done a show of uh, Agnes Martin at the School of Visual Arts uh, in a kind of uh, messy little gallery they had there. But it, the, the show was incredibly well received. And um, in a way, began Agnes's uh, tour out of um, being a hermit, away from being a hermit. W Douglas and I got lost in the heat, <laughs> looking for the, 
the, the Mesa where she lived. I, I have to go back. And um, this is a picture of that. In the big, I don't like PowerPoint, the slides are much better, but in the big pink area, there's a lot of gridding and a lot of landscape and a lot of mapping, uh, all in reference to Agnes. The, the lines around the edge are referring to um, Navajo land, New Mexico. The little blue rectangles looking at the mountain in night and day from top to bottom. And the poor is, is, a, is, a, is water that was running through that we had to cross. And so from the very beginning, I, I began to pour paint. I always loved the idea that it, it made a picture of itself, that if you poured paint, it was liquid and made a picture of liquid or water. 1992, it's part of a, uh, a three-part series. And this is the, also these paintings are all huge, um, 12 feet high, eight feet wide, 10 feet wide. Um, until recently, I, I thought that I was very big and so that I could uh, match my size. These two are paintings that I really love. They're, they're 14 feet high and about um, seven feet wide. And it's yellow and blue waterfall and blue and yellow waterfall. And around 1990 is when I began to uh, just pour the paint and not use other imagery in it. And using, using opposite colors, using primary colors very uh, still tied to some thread of conceptual art, or what we call conceptual art, because I guess every idea you have is a concept. This, the next is called Rooms with Colors, and it, it was done in, at the uh, museum in Dublin, and uh, the light was so incredible there. So the red primary color rooms leading to other rooms. Each room has the opposite two colors poured on the wall, brushstroke really. The, the brushstroke paintings are incredibly, um, for me, I, in the mid-80s, mid I, I uh, discovered uh, Japanism. And from Japanism, I uh, started to look at uh, Japanese and Chinese calligraphy and, and the calligrapher poets. And um, the brushstroke paintings and the poor paintings are very related to that and to the idea of uh, starting with concentration or meditation and just waiting until the, the moment is right. And when one feels the moment is right to make the gesture also like an athlete, like a diver or an archer or a runner, waiting for the moment and then, then doing it. And so this, the thing about doing these things directly on the wall is it's a, it's a one-time thing. You can't hide it. You can't throw it away. It's there. And this is one of my favorites because of the light on the color in the rooms and the fact that the light became part of the photograph. In the last room, the very small room, which is on your lower left, there's just a brush stroke, so it's, it's like a little sanctuary. This is the sketch for that piece, and it became the announcement. And that was a, a, a Leporello. Actually, something like the uh, project Dan and I are doing now. This, the little bird, 1969, is the first painting before my first painting in 1971. And my upstairs neighbor, Nancy Graves, gave me a bird in a cage and uh, that flew into her window from, from the uh, street fair below. And uh, in the first painting, I, I painted the sky 
in the clouds and so forth. Um, as I thought the bird would imagine it. And alongside the bird, I, I made a kind of color, color scale of all the colors that the bird might be dreaming of, including the black hole where it was caught in our, in our lofts. And then in 1972, I did this painting called uh, Veronica's Veil with no image on it. You know Veronica's Veil is the veil that wiped Christ's face and then his wiped his tears and then his image appeared on the veil. But on this veil, there is no image, but there's plenty of water. And you can you see water and sky. That's the 1972 painting. Below is a painting that I did a, in 2005. It's called Blue River. It's all poured paint, and it's uh, 38 feet long and 13 feet high, and uh, it's a big painting. This is called the Bruegel painting. It's um, in 1982 to 84. It took a long time to do. Um, it's from a Bruegel, the elder, later, earlier. I don't know which, the one who didn't paint people, he painted uh, Vanitas paintings. It's called the, the Bruegel painting of Vanitas of style, meaning in the painting, I divided up the uh, painting into 84 parts. In each section, I looked at the space in each section and um, interpreted it in terms of an artist from any period. And I had a wonderful time because I traveled around to museums <laughs> studying art. And uh, like a Victorian lady's art lessons. When I put it all together, uh, it made the picture. You can see an image. I put the little detail from to show you that I can really paint things too. <laughs> Not just poor <born> paint. <laughs> So <laughs> that's a very small paint. Each each of these sections w was about mm, two feet by two and a half feet. So the painting was about twenty feet high and sixteen feet wide, and it it traveled to a lot of museums and it's it lives in the Kunstmuseum in Bern now. I tried to buy it back, but. They have only one big wall and only one big painting, so they get keep it. This is a version in Rome of of the uh, self portrait. I don't know how well it reproduces, but this the stripes are not mine. It's it's a collaboration, and the and the floor isn't mine. But I think the whole thing looks very Byzantine. I love it. Love the way it looked in that space. And it was much smaller, just two smaller rooms. And I didn't do full figures, just noses and ears and eyes. This is in a in a in a building in Grenoble, France, that was built to build the Eiffel Tower in. So it's huge. And it was a continuous line. I, it's called Heart Line. And again, it's a line through history. The painting is from 1992. So in the mid 80s and mm, until about 92, I was directly involved with quotational work, with work that directly dealt with quotation. I made the sculpture too. And the this, this sculpture, all of these forms come from the same weight. So the same weight material made every one of these forms, even though they look so different, which is interesting. Um, after I painted the Bruegel painting and discovered Japanism, I, I um, painted first a square painting, first wave after Hokusai, 1986. And well, it's very cramped on the rectangle. 
and I then painted it, them long, about 15 feet long and about, um, I think, eight or nine feet high. Uh, these paintings have very complicated quotations. And the name of the red painting, 1985, on the bottom is called The Wave After Kobe, as though painted by Turner, influenced by the Chinese. So <laughs> it was not an obvious uh, thought pattern. And this, this is one of my favorites, and it's the wave after Corbet, as though painted by Ensor. In, <laughs> in fact, all the waves come from a series of paintings that Corbet did called Fear, the Fear paintings they were when he was um, try, trying to avoid prison. And uh, this is also, I don't know, 15 or 16 feet long, and. Uh, the, the arc of the waves is, is, is my height with a brush in my hand standing on high heels. So it's directly related to movement and to the body, as well as to my love of, of art, of those other artists, and a love of just doing it. I, I then went to Japan and um, heard about a wave room in a, uh, in a temple. It was very hard to get permission to see the room uh, or even to get into the temple, but we did. And then they wouldn't, they said no photographs, but when I lifted a pencil to draw what I saw, <laughs> the monk took away my pencil. And he, he understood no pictures in a big way. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I did a series of tondos. They're, they're uh, seven feet in diameter. That's what I can reach with the brush and the high heels. And this is called Moon Wave. And this is the last of them called Fire Wave. This is, I think, the, my, one of my favorite works I ever did. It's called 16 Waterfalls of dreams, memory, and desire. And it was the first of the waterfall paintings that I did. And um, again, it's about 12 feet long and a little less than half again as high. And they're, they're not quite monochromatic, these paintings, because they're, they're, they have a green underpainting that comes through the black and then very thin white. And I was very interested in the white painting itself as colors so that there is no gray. There's just white paint and it, it adds up because it's transparent so you, you get a kind of transparency and den density. These are two paintings that look alike, one from 74 and one from 91. And uh, I'm, I was always interested in the paint representing itself as a mark. So being a mark, being paint, and making an image all at once. But I think all, all, all art is abstract. All image making is abstract because it takes abstract thought to, com to combine the images so they look like a picture. The good thing about being an artist is that you don't have to make too much sense. You, can, you, you don't have to be like an art historian or a critic. Um, 2005, Night Moon, 1992, Cellar Door. On your right is 1992. And again, I find a resemblance. So I, I, I created this uh, to find resemblances between the different times, because although we always change, we also always stay somehow the same. This is Line Lima with the beans, Lima bean, and the other is uh, part, of, part of a panorama that I'm going to show you in, in a few minutes. 
This is called Dragon Tooth Waterfall. And it, it came after 16 Waterfalls of Dream, Memory, and Sentiment. And I started to realize I could really make pictures with them. Again, it's, it's 12 feet wide by six high. This is a smaller painting, two, two, four foot. It's eight foot wide and four feet high. Um, two sides, it's called nothing. Thinking that if I uh, crossed it out, it would be a white painting. Uh, uh, and also because once you do something, it's done. You can't really change it. So uh, this is my white painting. I was interested in rhyming, really. And I still am. Uh, this is a brush stroke, small brush stroke on a three, three, mm, three foot square canvas. And curtain waterfall, a uh, huge painting uh, that I like a lot. I, I think it's about 12 feet high and almost as wide. It's not square, but it looks a little square. And the black edge around it is, is not. It has no edge. It goes from top to bottom. It, it's a crop from someplace else. This is called ore. And again, I, I show it to show the poor because it's a 1973 painting. Again, huge. Uh, maybe seven or eight feet high and very long. And this is a called Wolf Waterfall. And it's a, a 14 foot high painting. My ladder is my best friend. I spend a lot of time on a ladder. And this is a panorama I built in a, in a Biennale that only had, only did twice in uh, Newcastle, England. But I was very lucky because it was a boat building town and so boat builder, and you can see on your right, the, the outside of the panorama structure was built by a boat, local boat builder, Andy Morgan, who, who was a terrific person. And with, with some of these, this was, I lit it with ultraviolet light. So when you, you went to a traditional tunnel in the dark, you climbed up some stairs and then you stood on the bow of the ship and looked at the waterfall. Um, and I lit it with blue light so, so that the water seemed to be floating real. It was just paint on canvas. But the dark and the light and the way the paint, imita the paint is fluid, so it looks fluid. And this one is from a 1992 documenta and it's all, it, it lives in a, well, it's probably finished by now, but uh, it lived for a long time in a, in a uh, museum park in, in Kyrgyzak, France, in Nord Normandy, that is. And when I went to see it, they, they had three of them. And when I went to see them, because it was real water in the place and, and the sun, I couldn't find it. It's, it's, it was like a mirage. It's called mirage. Um, it's white paint on scrim and with a little arrangement of nature around it. When the sun, the sun isn't on it in this picture, but when the sun is on it, you get dappling on the scrim, on the paint, the paint reflects on the leaves and it, uh, it looks real, like a mirage. This is a very early painting, the big, big one with a brush stroke, it's a scribble, a brush stroke, and an image. And through, through my life, I'm still amazed that you can take a scribble, a brush stroke, and make an image. <laughs> it, still, it still seems like a big deal to me. This is double waterfall, Valentine waterfall, it's called. And then these paintings are from my last exhibition in New York. Again, poured paint, but mm, much sim as simple as they can get. As the one on your left is called white, 
and the other one is called light. And the one light, it's white paint juxtaposed with silver paint, trying to see uh, how they reflect, if they reflect similar. In person, the reflection is similar. Of course, in the film, the silver catches the light. This is black on your left and about the black on your right, both 2007. And again, very tall paintings, I guess 12 feet high. And this, this is called the dark. These paintings were, uh, they were sort of saying, Barnett, I love your work, but I can't go on this way. I have to stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is Barnett with some splashes on them. They all are. They're poor. They're Barnett. This is a little bit earlier. It's called Mountain, and I was, I remember that Dorothea called me while I was painting this. <laughs> this is Sunspots from 2007. And it's all poured paint. This is River from 1998-99. And this is called Dusk. And it's silver and gray. I'm trying to balance them. And coming up are some other uh, pictures of other venues with the self-portrait in. The self-portrait is called self-portrait because it's, there, it's because the self is always changing and you can't pin down the self. There, I think when you're young, you think you're looking for yourself and you'll drive yourself crazy if you do that because you're always changing. And then there's the, the Buddhist idea of, of self, selflessness. So no, no self or all selves are the same self or and so these, these are, I, I like this piece. I was happy to do it again. These were all done in a very short number of years. Be, and um, like 87, 88, 89, I think this is the last one, 92. It's, it's not a good image, but this was done in, Dub, in Dairy Island. And they're Dura's racist <laughs> types. He did some incredibly racist drawings. My figure drawings downstairs, the standing figures are Dura. And these are all from Italian second string masters. And that's all. Thank you very much. It's a very, very generous overview. I love the fact that, um, as well as showing us your evolution, you have you've took the obviously highly intentional decision to, to juxtapose throughout the presentation um, early works and, and more recent works so that we uh, dissolve this notion of, uh, uh, well, perhaps it does two things. It, it reinforces the... Uh, the, the um, that deconstruction of self, that uh, self-portrait downstairs and then its other uh, incarnations um, bolsters. But at the same time, it shows us that um, uh, there are these great continuities between um, works of, of stylistic diversity. Um, I think what will strike us all very, very forcibly is, is that your earlier work, um, has a, a very, uh, as you, you jokingly pointed out in the, the Bruegel uh, detail, that I can do it if I want to. I mean, that's always the... Uh, uh, people who don't follow art always have that... Um, I, some family members of mine once said, you know, looked at an abstract painting, and they said, well, it's interesting to see his early work, so he, he could do it properly if, if he wanted to. I mean, um, and so that... Um, that sort of non-art person's dilemma is, is, is certainly satisfied in your work. There's obviously a very 
meticulous touch, um, which comes as a surprise to somebody who dispenses with a brush and um, embraces chance and um, uh, pouring. But then again, there's these continuities. Um, that's, of course, more a statement than the question. But the question that arises from that is how it feels for you um, in the reprise downstairs. Because, because self-portrait was a work from 87 that you made in various venues through, as you say, 92. Then it was left alone until I uh, had the audacity to suggest you might want to do it again here at the school. Um, considering the work that you make now, considering your problematic sense of self, um, how do you feel when you see that piece reconstructed, knowing what you're doing now? Well, I'm doing that now, too. I'm, I'm going to do it again at RISD with a drawing survey show I'm having. But I was, it, it was as though uh, David read my mind. I was about to look for a place to do this piece again. I, I had the idea that I would like to, all the other times I did it, they were in gray or black. They were charcoal on gray, gray stained walls, or white charcoal on black, black stained walls. And I had the idea that the piece was still, still had meaning, and that an audience now would, uh, would uh, like to see it. And that I would like to see it, most of all, I would like to see it in color. And uh, I think that the only real reason to make art is because we, the artists, would like to see it. So, so in those... See what it's going to look like. Mm. And so I was lucky to get the two rooms to, to see what it looks like. Ah, well, we were lucky to get it too. Um, what what uh, the, the um, earlier versions, which are in blue, that uses blue light on... On black. On black and white, and white images, yes. Yes, and so um, in in thinking of it in this new color, was that reconceiving the the piece to some extent, or is it is it a was it like a formal or dare one say a sort of decorative decision, or was there something conceptual in wanting to see it in blue? Well, it's in red, white, and blue. <laughs> and yellow, indeed. And but the yellow. blue is. I try. Well, the yellow doesn't count. <laughs> the yellow is just a place in the images. Um, no, it counts. The yellow is the grid, yes. Yeah, it counts, you see it. But, um, uh, well, I thought red, white, and blue, sort of. Um, you were feeling patriotic? Wasn't I was feeling poor Obama's getting so attacked. <laughs> <laughs> that we need a little flag. I wanted to see it in color, and I... I I, I think of it in primary colors, so red, yellow, and blue. But I wanted this, this chalk line to be white because I was still considering putting blue light on it mm -hmm. when I did it to, to make the wall disappear and the image float in the room. And I decided not to because it, I liked, I, it looked finished. I liked it the way it was without the blue light. Also because the small space, there are a lot of issues with blue light. One is ultraviolet light is very bad eyes and a blue bulb doesn't do quite the same thing mm -hmm. and in such a small space where you can't get a distance on it mm -hmm. the blue light is, is really not good especially in the art school what would strike mm -hmm. me as more of a conti continuity mm -hmm. than um, a diversity in your work is that when you go from uh, very tight works that are uh, are quoting other artists, whether Audubon or Leonardo or Courbet, and then you go to very expressive, free works that dispense with a brush and go straight for the poor. Um, of course, those represent two extremes, two polar opposites are, uh, as far as expression are concerned, but what unites them is that they're radical strategies for undermining a sense of personal touch. Um, would you say you're an artist who's trying to get away from personal touch? Does, does working with assistance in the realization of the, the work downstairs or not using brushes and seeing what chance comes up with, is that, is that some, 
Does that represent some um, distrust of touch? No, not at all. Um, I, in fact, it's not even what I thought about. Um, it, it, it could be interpreted that way, and, and maybe it is that way, but it's not what I thought of. I, I think that everything is self-expression and everything is not self-expression. That we, we live in history and historical time, and especially now when so much art is refers to other art, even without um, saying what the quotation is. Um, the brush, the court paint is, is totally that um, I, making prints in California with Crown Point Press, I got to know John Cage. Mm -hmm. Got interested in his, he had a complicated system for chaos. I thought um, if I just pour the paint, that's chaotic enough. That uh, chance, 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 gravity will be the chance that pulls the paint down. So it wasn't, it wasn't really getting away from, I don't like art that people say, oh, I'm trying to express myself. Mm -hmm. I think that you need to express yourself, um, or if you're having trouble expressing, you know, you know where to go. <laughs> but but um, I, I'm trying to, I'm, I, I'm making paintings. I, I, I'm trying to make visual poetry. I'm trying to make, although I sat here for 20 or 40 minutes and described my work, I'm actually trying to make the images that describe themselves mm -hmm. that are without, I am, I'm a, I have poet friends. Mm -hmm. I, in some, some of the paintings, I, the titles are I tried to make two word poems, limit myself to two words. And, um, you know, it, I, I love words. I, I, I write about art sometimes. I like to read, <laughs> but I want to make images that describe and explain themselves that I don't have to explain. And the reason I got so intrigued by the poet calligraphers is that the image and the word are the same thing. Mm -hmm. that they have equal value. They are the same thing. Mm -hmm. That what he's painting a word and he, the, it's a picture word. We can't do that in English. Mm -hmm. But in Chinese or Japanese you can. Oh, you mean in the actual, just the calligraphy? Absolutely. It's a, it's a poem. It's a, it's, it's a poem, it's a word, mm -hmm. and it's a picture yes. all at once. Yeah. And so that's that's what I was moving off of. So I really wasn't moving off of whether it's personal or not personal, expressive or not expressive. Right. Although I don't like the word, I don't like the words figurative, non-objective, mm -hmm. expressionism. <laughs> right. Minimalist. I don't like those words. I try to not even think about them. Well, they're all pigeonholes that yeah. close down rather than open up, which is the problem with, with categories. Um, and not to therefore commit the blunder of uh, falling into those categories. Let me nonetheless suggest that within your work, within your works, there are very different kinds of experience to be enjoyed. Um, I haven't, alas, had the privilege of entering into that piece you did in, in uh, uh, Newcastle in, um, in the, the short-lived biennial there. Um, remember the piece that's where the shipbuilder has, has created that panorama? But one gets the sense, and certainly I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing um, a beautifully installed room of paintings, for instance, at the Locks Gallery in Philadelphia, large-scale mm -hmm. um, waterfall works hung in those beautiful square rooms of that very mm -hmm. high gallery there, where one is completely um, immersed. It's an oceanic experience because the, the sensation uh, envelops one, and that's clearly uh, manifestly uh, intentional in the Newcastle piece and clearly clearly intentional in all the large-scale um, uh, paintings. And that's a very different experience 
indeed from, um, I would imagine, from say looking at a work which is um, much like, like Legend, the, the first work you looked at, which has um, a much more kind of conceptual, linguistic um, kind of um, uh, uh, way of proceeding. Um, do, do you have a sense of um, going for something very different, the sensual, the cerebral, or do you, do you find that now you've found ways that, that, that brings them together? Um, do, do you have a sense of, I'm doing something different when you go for the, say, the more oceanic or for the more verbal? Well, I think it's the same, that, that it's one changes and changes back again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not, things, things aren't linear and thought isn't linear. And because making art is like playing, and I've been doing it a long time, so I just do it two ways, for myself and from the heart. And that's, that's what it is. And so I really follow any path I feel like, because mm -hmm. nobody's asked me to do it. Nobody tells me to stop. <laughs> so <laughs> I just do it. And... Um, but I can see the difference. The, the, the legend, I was an editor at Semiotext. Yes. I was involved with heresies. Well, not really with printed matter. All, all those were about to begin. None of them had started yet. Right. And I, I had just stopped working as an art director for book publishing. So um, I was more student-like in my mm -hmm. thought pattern than I am now. Yes, yes. But in the, in the redux uh, of, of uh, self-portrait, um, I have a sensation of, of getting a very strong dose of those two, those two approaches, in that the, um, the, the blue staining of the walls and the, um, the all-overness uh, and the um, intensity, the chromatic intensity, is very enveloping, but at the same time, it's it's a quotational and b um, uses the hands um, of assistants and who are working from projections. So, um, well, I couldn't. One of the reasons I I couldn't possibly I would die trying to do all that work by myself. I couldn't possibly do it physically speaking. Yeah. Um, number one. Number two. It is a quote, it's a quote of an earlier work from, from a time when I was uh, dipping in and out of uh, more, more uh, uh, I don't know what I would call it, work more tied to uh, language. Mm -hmm. And um, But I think that it, it adds up to something I hope that it adds up to something that is other than language, that you couldn't mm -hmm. decipher it, that when you stand in it, I hope mm -hmm. the feeling is like being inside of somebody's head right. without words. That, that's what I would hope for, without explanation, although it is quotation. The standing figures are Dura. <coughs> People didn't exercise then, you can see mm -hmm. from his body types. Yes. But, um, yeah, the, the, the eyes. And um, I, I work, the big installations are all done with assistants. And I brought two, but uh, I couldn't do it all myself. And I, Anthony Sensoda, an old friend, was the project manager, and he will be again, I hope on two more projects uh, this year. But um, it's true, I'm, I'm picking up a lost thread, a dropped thread, and I'm doing more installation work again this year. Right. I, for a long time, I did only paintings. The installation downstairs, it should be um, pointed out, uh, it enlisted the, the volu volunteers from among the student body. Yes, uh, yes. I don't here, know if they're the here school. now. Anyway, I think but. some of them are. Put your hands up if you were... Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, but uh, but three of the three of the five who 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 worked with you, um, um, that's there's something sort of in a way rather 
touchingly medieval about having these apprentices and journeymen and and um, I, I wasn't wasn't going for a laugh. I'm always happy to get a laugh, but I, I actually meant you know that um, in a way um, there is something. Uh, it's interesting that installation, uh, wall drawing, it comes out of the very radical period of the 60s and 70s, uh, and you were you know a pioneer of all that. Um, you, you and Sol Lewitt were were together in Italy, and that was. Um, you, I think you know you both very much probably influencing each other and um, and also well, no he first he was he's a little older first. yes <laughs> yes <laughs> that's true that's true and then um, but it, what I what I was getting at is that the, it's the, it's the the counterculture and and the sort of breakdown of the easel painting is what in a way led to um, wall drawing installation but at the same time. Um, it refers back to a kind of pre-modern uh, way of making art as well, doesn't it? I, mean, I was very touched when you were saying that you loved the way that the uh, galleries downstairs felt like uh, an Egyptian uh, sarcophagus, or no, I'm sorry, mausoleum, um, uh, um, and that, that um, uh, I, I think Lewitt said at some point that he wanted to be able to make something that he'd be proud to show Giotto, so that in a way, um, the wall drawing as a, as a radical departure from the easel tradition is also a radical, a, in, the, in the true sense, radical, going back to roots of painting before it was confined to an easel. Do, do you have a sense of wanting to make environments and that being important to your project? It, in the mid 80s, it was very important to early 90s. And I, then I just wanted to make paintings. But now, well, most of the young artists are making installation work, so I want to be young too. I want to make installation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want I, I I want to pick up that thread that I dropped, mm -hmm. and and I am. I'm going to I'm going to do a big installation in the uh, very difficult uh, Cincinnati uh, Contemporary Art Museum. It's mm. uh, the design. Wow. And yes. I'm going to try to obscure her. You're going to take her on. <laughs> I'm going to take her on. <laughs> it's a very complicated architecture, so it's a real test. But um, Will it be a similar work from to self-portrait? Will it use? No, no, no. It'll be completely different. It, it, it'll be a boat ride. Uh -huh. <laughs> a drunken boat, maybe. Like a Rambo. drunken ride. <laughs> a, uh, a stormy boat ride. Because mm -hmm. the museum it does this. <laughs> Let's talk a little more about chance, because uh, you've mentioned Buddhism in relation to self-portrait and, and the sense of the non-self or the uh, universal self. Um, and your paintings, one, doesn't, one never likes to be presumptuous about what it might feel like to make a painting that one isn't making oneself, but the sensation you have looking at your paintings is of um, a kind of free ecstatic moment of um, release and and discovery of something bigger than the self D do you consider painting to be in any way a mode of meditation a form of meditation um, pre-painting let's say it's meditation in the way that um, I, I have a diver meditates before he jumps off the board Mm -hmm. The way an archer meditates before he pulls the string. Uh, concentration, meditation. My paintings take a long time to do, and I spend months looking like I'm not doing anything, and Lily must wonder what I'm doing. No, <laughs> she knows what I'm doing. <laughs> but um, I set up the canvas, and I listen to music. I look at the canvas. I decide on my colors beforehand. And then I wait until I feel healthy enough, vigorous enough, and um, until, in a way, until I see the image on the canvas. Mm -hmm. And then I jump up, climb up my ladder, grab my bucket of paint, and <laughs> make, make the mark. In, the, the good thing about making paintings is if it fails, I just put it away. 
and if it's on the wall in somebody else's museum, well, there it is, it's just there. So doing installation, it's like a trapeze act in a way, because if you fall, you fall publicly, whereas with painting, you might fall and not know it, you know, and have a big show and look at, and look at the paintings and think, oh my God, <laughs> I have to leave town. But, but other, otherwise, um, you can just hide them. So mm. the chance of, of the worst that happens is I, I lose a fortune's worth of canvas and paint. Yes. <laughs> but I don't... You don't necessarily lose an idea because that yeah. image you saw, on, can, can that can image re recur then? The same image that you well, see? Well, not the same image, but I can... As, let's say you throw the ball. The ball mm. doesn't go... It's not the same, but it's the same person throwing it to the same other person. Mm -hmm. So it, it has a similarity. Dare one inquire into the ratio of success to failure in your practice, or is that uh, private? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps your studio assistants will know from the categorizing all the putting things away. But uh, is there a chance for correction? No. And um, the criterion that that you elect for success or failure is it um, related to the image that was in your mind's eye? Is it a, a, a formal response to what's happened? It's a formal response to what's happening. I immediately abandon what was in my mind's eye and go <laughs> forward. <laughs> he's laughing, thinks he has left. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> what? I'm yeah, I know. I know you know. <laughs> but is there is there a sense though that um because so much chance goes into making it, uh, or, or a degree of chance. I mean, the truth of the matter is that even if you're um uh, Ray Dutte, there's a degree of chance when you put your tiny little brush to yes, the uh, to the to the canvas or the page. The same. But um, is there what what you get in Cage with his dependence on the I Ching, um, and is is and also his entrusting his works as all composers do to interpreters, is um, is an openness to chance beyond just being a mechanism. Um, for realizing the sound or the, the image, but actually just being open to the sense that the work is bigger than yourself. It sounds like, however, in your practice, although you use the um, the relative mechanism of chance with the with the pouring, that you remain very much in the saddle. You you know you know the kind of thing you want. Is that uh, John knew the kind of thing he wanted too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Both in his visual and his uh, music, yeah. and but again, it's so it's just to repeat the question and perhaps repeat the answer. Purely formal in deciding what is working or not. Um, it depends what you interpret as purely formal. So this is what I really do. I, I make the body of work, and I don't look at it. Uh -huh. When. When I take it out to exhibit it, mm -hmm. John Chan, Su Yen, Frederica Hunter, they, they come in and they decide. Oh, really? <laughs> so you have uh, collaborators in students who draw, and you have collaborators in dealers who to say whether well, it's saleable or not, or, or not good saleable, or not. Not saleable, but they're, they've become good friends, those three. Right, yes. And they, they're, they're good friends, and we decide how to make a show. A show is different right. than making a painting. Right. Then, then you have to assemble them into an exhibition, mm -hmm. and that's different. And sometimes I have paintings that wait around to be in an exhibition. <laughs> they, have, they have to wait online. Yes. So it's their turn. But to, do, paintings, to do paintings not bypass exhibitions in their, their, in their route to collectors? Sometimes. Sometimes. Because it sounds like, in fact, all your shows then are installations. You're, you're an installation yes. artist, even when you're showing I I, I guess that canvases. isn't even, I suppose that's the same for most painters. Really? 
I, I would guess, I don't know, I never talked about it to somebody, but you make a show and that, mm -hmm. that's different than 17 random things in a room together. And often, if you, if you, if you know the people you work with, I mean, I used to have Martin Friedman and, and um, Herbie Vogel come in and look, but unfortunately, you know, they're both uh, very old, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they don't do that anymore. Well, I think there are, I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised, and I, I think we should sort of um, organize a, an opinion poll among uh, artists. We might even ask people to think about it and at some point do it tonight, those of you who are artists, because, I mean, I certainly know many artists who, um, for whom a show is the impetus to make a body of work. And then I know artists who um, work in series or in themes and want to keep certain works together for a show. Oh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Maybe I wasn't clear. I do work in themes. Yes. So it's always, I have bodies of work. So yes. when somebody, when I'm planning to exhibit with somebody, mm. Um, I show them a body of work. Right, but you show them a body of works that all of which you're happy with. No, not necessarily, because I don't trust sometimes what I'm happy with. Oh. Sometimes at the beginning I'm unhappy with the best work because mm -hmm. it looks just the, the, just the way it is to look at a stranger's work, you know. If mm -hmm. your work is really good, when I first see it, I, I scream. <laughs> if I can't understand it, mm -hmm. To me, it means it might be very good. Yes. And um, the same with my own work. So I don't, right. I don't make a pre-selection because sometimes um, I can't recognize what's the breakthrough work or the next step right. or the best piece in the series. So you're pretty reticent to destroy or discard work then? I don't destroy anything. I put it away. Oh, right. You better be careful with a tax man and someday down the line this is the, you ha, you'll have to well I don't, I don't know. get taxed on my own work all oh, right yes <laughs> that's whoever true whoever inherits it will get taxed yes <laughs> well can be out to empty, or, as they say. Or, yes <laughs> well then in and then then we could be I could be an expert we could all be everyone in this room an expert witness we can say to Uncle Sam actually until Su Yan Lox and John Chime say that this is working as a show. These are actually just preliminary sketches. It These are not works. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not worth anything when, they're, when I make them in my possession. Right. That's why if I give them to a benefit, I can't get a tax deduction. Right. Right. Well, we're getting a little, little overly fiscal here for what uh, <laughs> sh should be a, a purely a discussion of aesthetics. But I think there is a fascinating aesthetic component to, to, to what to what you're describing, because, um, but uh, at the same time, one that fits very, very well with um, the the aesthetic and intellectual background that you've described in your talk and that we we're, we're learning about in your work. Because a very a much more traditional um, studio practice would um, finish a work, be happy with that work, uh, dedicate to that work as being done. Usually, the, the the signature is often the the means by which an artist signals to herself or the world that they're happy with that thing, and that thing is not merely a thing but a work of art. But what I'm gathering here is is a sense of a process in which the show uh, is is the is the aesthetic realization no, no, of the not work. No, no, not that either. Not that you're too exact. <laughs> that old art historian. Yes. Um, <laughs> not that either. A show is a show, but it doesn't yes. mean it doesn't mean two years after the show I don't say, Oh God, that was awful. <laughs> <laughs> that third piece on the left should have been in the in the Not skip. even that. Maybe I didn't like to, maybe in retrospect mm. I don't like the whole body of work. But I'm older than you are, so I have permission to do all that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to say, I don't like it and I did it. <laughs> now, of course, um, that privilege to, to like and dislike and to um, dedicate and not um, 
is suspended, as you say, in that tightrope act of, of an installation, but it's also something that's put aside when you collaborate. So with, a, for instance, a poet, with, with Anne, um, in, in uh, Christ or Gaze. Um, uh, do, by the way, go to artcritical.com and look, look at it, and later uh, it's going to be realized, it's going to be printed. It's being printed now. Being printed as we speak by uh, the Brodsky Center at Rutgers in New Jersey. Yes. At last, I saw a proof of one mark. <laughs> Wonderful. And one section of the poem. We should just, um, uh -huh. if we can, because we're describing of all the images we've, yeah. we've seen, we're actually describing something that we didn't see. <laughs> um, but we're talking here about uh, two scrolls, obviously that the, the reference to Asian art is very strong there. Uh, although it's, it does fold from left to right. We've got uh, two scrolls. One has the, your image, and the other has Anne's poem, um, which you will then be able to see the image through the poem. N not quite. Um, the image will be printed. It's printed on tra handmade translucent paper, the poem, in red, over, over a shadow image. <coughs> of the image of yes. the painting, the image being um, the but So the image gets printed twice, once in shadow within the yeah. translucent page which contains the red yeah, poem, yeah. and once on its own without the poem, but that you can yeah. see through. Yeah. But that's how, that's how the proposal was. But because it's being printed in etching um, mm -hmm. and paper pulp, the text will be in paper pulp, Red, red paper pulp in the translucent paper, mm -hmm. um, and we're proofing. There, there are probably color changes, and, and uh, you know. Was this the kind? Was this the kind of collaboration in which um, the poet's words changed at all in relation to the image, mm -hmm. or did the poem come first and the image responded the, to the poem? The, actually, the poem came first, sort of, but the poem responded to. Okay, Anne is here. No, <laughs> Responded to yeah. the things you were doing and to a certain sense of a frank time frame of, of coming to your studio mm -hmm. and seeing what you were doing and seeing some of the work that was going to be in it and also to responding to you in a way as some kind of presence. And then the reverse happened. Mm -hmm. As the poem was being written and changed and rewritten, I responded to the poem. So it was a real exchange. Symbiotic. Yeah. Very good exchange. And I love her sense of things or her symbols of themselves. Mm -hmm. So strong that the image of and so that becomes very uh, important. That there's not you know hidden hidden it, you know, there's there's a lot of um, layering but it's it's manifest. Manifest. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, and, and I'm, of course, a great fan of Anne's work. And I'm a great fan of your work. <laughs> it took three years to get a proof. <laughs> one proof of one image. There, I don't know how many images. We have a lot, a lot of pages, 17 pages. Mm -hmm. So I've seen one. Fantastic. Well, Pat, you've answered many of the questions that I would have asked in your wonderful talk and you've answered the rest that I did ask and you could answer more that I could ask but as we have you see even I can do this Zen stuff you know but as we have been so interested in the notion of chance and collaboration I think it would be a little bit overly hierarchical for me to be the only one asking any questions so uh, this is a stage where we can first thank you for what you've said so far and then ask members of the audience if they would like to ask some questions of Pat themselves. Yes. That was a long-winded way of saying if you want to clap now, you can. And... <laughs>